Well, welcome everyone to um, Grand Rounds for the Pathology Department. Um, our speaker today, as everyone is aware, is Dr. Uh, Francesco LaRosa, who is affectionately known as Paco. Um, and he uh, has been with us for a number of years, but I think many of us are not totally aware of his background, which is very stellar. He went to medical school in Lima, Peru, graduating in 1975, and then trained for his initial pathology under an extremely famous name, um, Dr. Javier Arias Stella, which who was also in Peru. And for those of you who don't do the subspecialties that Dr. LaRosa does, um, you can still be interested in his talk because of course the Aria Stellis reaction is very well known in endometrium. It's one of those um, things that can be easily mistaken for a malignancy by the unaware. So his uh, mentor was really a very famous pathologist. Paco came to Denver in 1981 to work as a fellow in transplantation immunology with um, Dr. David Talmadge, who is also a famous name uh, here in Colorado. He devoted the first part of his career to research, receiving several fellowships during those 10 years from the Kroc Foundation, the Juvenile Diabetes Foundation, Diabetes Research and Education Foundation, and even held a uh, R01 grant for three years from the NIH. However, he returned to his love of pathology in the 1990s when he trained again in pathology at the University of Colorado, and then worked afterwards in molecular um, lung pathology with uh, Dr. Wilbur Franklin. He's been on the staff for 27 years. He's active, of course, in genital urinary sign-out, uh, renal sign-out, but also in heart transplantation, um, and, as well as pathology informatics, telehealth, and telemedicine. He has over 100 publications in peer-reviewed journals, he is very active in the College of American Pathologists, where I believe he's probably the most active person for helping residents get successful um, presentations at our annual CAP meeting. So he's in CAP, American Neurological Association, American Telemedicine Association, the Peruvian American Medical Association, and the Catholic Medical Association. He founded a journal, a Spanish language journal in 2012, Revista de la, de la Atit, AITT, which is a uh, telemedicine journal, and he remains the editor in chief on that. And he's also a member of SWOG, where he is very involved in the innovative diagnosis and treatment of prostate and urinary cancer. All of us know some of his wonderful hobbies, including um, photography and video. And of course, he's been very supportive of the poster sessions over the years, especially the virtual poster sessions we had to do during um, COVID, uh, as well as medical students in general. His talk today is going to focus on one of his areas of expertise, prostate cancer, and we're most interested to hear his presentation on the third dimension in the pathology of prostate cancer. Thank you again for being willing to share with us today. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, BK. I really appreciate your help in this introduction. And I welcome everybody who is in line. And I would like to talk this time about the third dimension in the pathology of prostate cancer. Um, uh, the learning objectives, uh, you already had them before, and we are going to do a basic review of the history of the prostate biopsies in the diagnosis of prostate cancer, and then compare it with the uh, transurethral resection, uh, ultrasound guided um, biopsies with the transperineal mapping biopsies, and then the transperineal baby biopsies with the prostatectomy specimens and then the applications in the clinical setting. Uh, just as a review, uh, this is the uh, conventional way that we used to learn anatomy in the past with these nice pieces, uh, autopsy preparations and plastification, where you can see a nice uh, urinary bladder that is open with the prostate in this area, the seminal vesicles, ureters, and then the typical cartoon where we can see in a very nicer detail the size of the prostate gland that is just considered the size of a nut and in younger people and with just only 20 25 grams of weight and then uh, we will see how this gland uh, continues growing during the age of uh, male individuals who are going to uh, after past the 50 or 60 years of age are going to double in size. And then uh, in many cases have these complications of cancer development. This is a cartoon just to show the uh, 
in a very schematic way, the different areas, we like to put um, everything in boxes, uh, usually, even though they don't look like that in the real life. So the bladder is going to have the connection with the urethra, the prostatic urethra, and then the penal urethra at the other end. And it has this angulation. And then in the anterior aspects of the prostate, we're going to have mostly uh, fibromuscular tissue with a few glands only. And in the posterior aspect of the prostate, we have the peripheral zone, and then the central zone and the transition zone. Here, uh, these are the normal uh, sizes of these areas uh, in, in a younger individual. But later on, the transition zone is the one that is going to grow in a very disproportional way to uh, almost replace the whole prostate pushing to the periphery, the peripheral zone and the central zone, and uh, producing what is called uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia or BPH. It's interesting to mention that the seminal vesicles are connected with the urethra through the ejaculatory duct. And then in the moment of ejaculation, uh, all this uh, mixture of uh, material, biological and biochemical from the seminal vesicles with spermatozoids and then the prostate gland in a particular way are going to provide all the nutrients for the sperm to be able to survive in a, uh, a very hostile environment. Uh, in includes uh, uh, and, uh, these uh, biological uh, function in procreation. So we have here another cartoon in, uh, this is a, the previous one was a sagittal section. Here we have a, a transversal section, uh, the prostate as compared with a normal uh, histological preparation of the whole prostatectomy specimen. Uh, in the center here, we have the uh, urethra and these uh, rounded uh, nodular uh, structures that are um, basically what we call nodular prostatic hyperplasia that is produced by the um, glands that are in the transitional zone. Here again, we have the transitional zone around the urethra then the central zone and the peripheral zone with the location of the ejaculatory ducts in the posterior aspect of the prostate, the Veromontan where the connection with the ejaculatory ducts is present and the anterior aspect of the prostate that it has mostly this fibromuscular tissue. Um, this introduction is uh, important, I think, because uh, we are going to talk about the pathology of the prostate but uh, we uh, had the opportunity to work in the basic anatomy of the prostate. And this was a grant that we got uh, in 2006 and seven from the Butcher uh, Foundation in which Dr. Vic Spitzer, uh, who is the father of this uh, three-dimensional man and woman reconstruction from cadavers that we all know that is Vox Populi this on all over the, con the, the country and all over the world. Uh, these uh, three-dimensional reconstructions are very uh, helpful for the uh, learning of anatomy and in many areas where there is no uh, availability of cadavers, uh, he is using these uh, three-dimensional reconstructions. And also this uh, grant was uh, provided with, uh, in association with Dr. Mark Dubin. And this was one of the requirements for this grant in which people from uh, the, the Boulder campus and from our campus got together to do this kind of simulation. At that time, Dr. Spitzer had a camera that had a very poor resolution and we were able to buy this nice camera with a very high resolution that uh, here this is Dr. Mark Dubin, he, his uh, three-dimensional uh, array uh, with different uh, kind of uh, screens uh, at that time, uh, there was no the kind of uh, stereoscopic, stereoscopic uh, devices that we have nowadays, even for entertainment. But we were able to do three-dimensional reconstruction. This is the laboratory. And then the, um, the pelvis of a donor, a person who, who was uh, sentenced to death, uh, he donated his body. And then the pelvis was embedded in this gelatin uh, block uh, uh, minus uh, 40 degrees centigrade. And then with this planner that is uh, basically a carpenter uh, tool, 
we will uh, scratch the surface of this block 50 microns at a time and then with these jets of alcohol we'll clean all the debris and then with the high resolution camera we will take pictures and then we were able to get uh, several hundreds images of the pelvis similar to this one this is the most representative where you can see the location of the prostate in the center with the seminal vesicles in the posterior aspect the urethra here the bladder urinary bladder with a, a blue colloid the veins are represented by these dark uh, clots and blood and then the arteries were injected with a green wax to be able to identify them here you can see the muscles in the pelvis and the bones the fat and then the rectum with fecal material surrounded by this nice cushion of adipose tissue in relationship with the uh, prostate and also you can uh, imagine the accessibility that we have of the prostate from the rectum at least uh, to approach it from the posterior aspect of the prostate as you will see later on in the application of the prostate biopsies to sample uh, its tissue for the presence of cancer. Here is a video that we developed for this budget project in which we did, uh, are showing uh, remove the sound. We are showing the block going underneath this uh, planner, uh, the carpentry planner coming out and then being flushed with this uh, alcohol to clean the surface and be able to produce these nice pictures that you saw before. Uh, so we used these hundreds of images and we did a three-dimensional reconstruction of the prostate and with the objective of creating a system in which uh, physicians probably uh, or even residents and fellows can practice the endoscopic examination uh, through the prosthetic urethra. So all these images that you are seeing here is just basically uh, the put together all these uh, uh, images to create uh, this laboratory in virtual laboratory in which we were able to uh, reproduce uh, what will be very close to what is an in vivo prostate tissue. From the historical point of view, it's very interesting to uh, recollect the uh, little bit of the sequence of uh, events that gave uh, rise to the study of the prostate tissue through biopsies. The first one was done in 1922 by Beringer, who using the transperineal approach, this is very interesting because later on, we are going to see that in the late 80s, we were able to go back to here, there's a misspelling in the mapping. Uh, uh, we are going to back, go back to the transperineal approach because without having to go through the rectum that produce uh, is a very contaminated environment and the, from which we are going to be approaching a, a sterile tissue, uh, this uh, original uh, researcher, uh, Dr. Waringer, he was able to uh, conceive the, the approach to the perineum to be able to get to the prostate. Later on in 1930, uh, Ferguson was the first one, it had to be eight years difference, to have a collection of some cases doing an aspirate of prostate tissue with needles number 18 also uh, through the transperineal route. And then later on in 1937, it was the first transrectal biopsy. At that time, they didn't have ultrasound, but later on in 1963, like more than 30 years later, is that introduction of the uh, ultrasound allowed to visualize the prostate and be able to get a better uh, approach with uh, targeting the prostate through the pre through, through the rectal uh, uh, route. The first application was later done in 1967 uh, with the use of this also transrectal ultrasound guided biopsies. And the first transperineal mapping biopsies were just done in 1980, going back to the same uh, approach that. Uh, was done in 1922 by Barringer and then uh, with, with better uh, material, better equipment, uh, also within combination of the ultrasound. So 
in, in, in general, the technique of the prostate biopsy uh, has gone through all this evolution since the initial transperineal biopsies in the 20s. Then uh, the transrectal ultrasound uh, guided uh, started to create this kind of uh, protocols in which we will do uh, what is called the sextant fashion uh, for the sampling of the prostate at different uh, levels, uh, in be able to sample in a more uh, systematic way the, the prostate uh, and then be able to identify cancer in different locations. And then uh, there is an evolution on the number of uh, biopsies that have been used to, to do this uh, study. And then in the past uh, two decades, uh, the transperineal biopsies have demonstrated that there's a high correlation between the accuracy for detection of cancer uh, uh, in, in the clinical uh, setting, and also uh, has per allowed to have a more rational approach in regards to the therapy of, of this prostate cancer, because um, we can see that in many cases, individuals in the past that were uh, treated with just radical prostatectomies, especially individuals in young age, they had acquired this kind of a, a very unpleasant morbidity of not having a prostate with uh, the consequence of uh, uh, impotence and, and, and loss of the urinary uh, control. This is the uh, a cartoon just to approach the prostate from the rectum with this uh, ultrasound probe that it has inside the needles and then we are going to start poking the prostate from the posterior aspect. And this is very important to remember because when we see prostates that are larger size that are going to grow from the apical point of view and also from the anterior posterior aspect, the uh, approach from the rectum is going to be very limited, especially if there are cancers that are in the anterior aspect of the prostate or in the apical location. So the current recommendation that we were doing uh, uh, in even in the common practice nowadays is that to do what is called the extended biopsy scheme because uh, at the beginning they were using four biopsies, two at each side, then they increased it to eight and then to 12. And then uh, all these uh, biopsies are the common specimen that we receive in the pathology practice. The biopsy of the transition zone is not recommended because we can lesion uh, or produce some damage of the urethra. Uh, this is just a recompilation of the different aspects of the stages that we have after we receive the biopsies in these vials, then put in cassettes, uh, embedded in paraffin to do sections, and then uh, study these uh, uh, specimens. And this is a very iconic uh, picture with Dr. Uh, Gary Miller uh, and the microscope that we will make a uh, special mention at the end. So uh, one of the important things just to be considered as well is that in the examination of these biopsies, we need to have some good collaboration with the histopathology lab. And that's something that has been developed very well here in our uh, laboratory because we have a prostate laboratory uh, that is, has been a center of reference for different uh, research uh, protocols that we had through the years. And the ideal way is not to load these slides with too many cores. Here we have up to a maximum of three cores very nicely in parallel to each other. And these are unfortunately the way that is being done in other laboratories that we receive for second opinion. This is what I call the spaghetti protocol in which <laughs> you can see that is there is a small focus of uh, cancer, it's going to be very difficult to identify, especially to measure, et cetera. So uh, now going back to the aspects of the, uh, the, the transperineal or the transrectal approach versus the transperineal approach, and also uh, factors that are going, to be con are going to be conditioned by the size of the prostate. Here we have uh, this uh, assortment of fruits that from a very small size, uh, lemon here, and then uh, some grapefruits in which you can imagine that if we're going to take only eight or 12 cores 
of biopsies to be able to sample these uh, specimens and trying to find the seeds that would be uh, equivalent, say, to the presence of foci of uh, prostate cancer. We will be more successful to find the cancer in the smaller specimens as compared with the larger specimen. So here is a problem. How can we rely on just a specific number of prostate cores taking a different patient that have different sizes of the prostate? So here is an example. Just imagine that this is the prostate, this is posterior aspect, the rectum is here, and these bars are representing the needles that we're going to introduce into the prostate through the rectum to be able to sample a cancer that usually is present in the posterior aspect of the prostate. So this approach, it works very well for these areas. But for example, if we have a cancer, called, like in this particular case that is in the anterior aspect of the prostate, it's going to be very difficult to approach, especially if the prostate is even larger than that. So these patients are going to be diagnosed based on just the cancer that in the posterior aspect, but we have absolutely no clue, no idea what is going on in the rest of the prostate. So this is one of the things that Dr. Um, Mil Gary Miller uh, in the uh, year 96 and 97, uh, I found this interesting uh, piece of uh, uh, data from the NIH in which at that time, he is the one who came up with the idea that we are not able to just make two dimensional uh, diagnosis, just relying on the two dimensional uh, structures of these biopsies that we see under the microscope. But he mentioned that the advantages has to, to be taken on the power of modern computer modeling capabilities that at that time, I remember the, the computers were humongous monsters. And then uh, the group that he put together with Dr. Priya Warahera, who is a bioengineer, and, and, and they developed an algorithm for three-dimensional reconstructions of prostatic histopathological features from radical prostatectomy specimens. So here we see a little bit of the history of this three-dimensional approach that we are inherited and we continue working uh, as well. So uh, at that time, uh, in, uh, when I was already uh, working in, in the area of prostate pathology, uh, here in, in the Department of Pathology, with the group of Dr. Verajera and Dr. Crawford, we were able to demonstrate that the volume of the prostate gland is extremely important to be able to detect prostate cancer and also high-grade pain, the lesion that is a precursor of the cancer. Here you have the percentage of lesions that are being detected. So prostate cancer was detected very easily in prostates that were very low volume, but according to the volume was increased, the capacity to detect cancer was significantly decreased. So this is basically a, a very objective way to demonstrate that we cannot be using a specific number of, or a fixed number of biopsy uh, cores to assess the pathology of prostates that have completely different volumes. So in this uh, presentation, we also were able to uh, demonstrate uh, from a very even mathematical approach that the we had to modify uh, our conventional protocol and put a number of uh, biopsies based on the size of the specimen. In these cases, if the volume is less than 15 cc, uh, we can do some accurate uh, sampling with just uh, four biopsies to each side, but if we increase the size from 15 to 50 uh, cc, we need to increase the number of biopsies as well as in cases of prostate biopsy or prostate glands that uh, in the practice are the most common. They have a volume of 50 cc or more in which we have to increase also the number of biopsies as you can see here in, 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 in this outline. So we recommended at the time to perform this midline system biopsies with a modified fan system and with using these numbers based on the volume of, of the prostate. So we now enter to the area of the trans 
perineal um, ma mapping biopsies and uh, Emiliosi uh, was, was the first one in 2001. This was the time when Gary Miller uh, passed away. And he uh, already was demonstrated the capacity of the transperineal mapping biopsies to increase the sensitivity of detecting prostate cancer, not only the detection of cancer itself, but the detection of cancer of higher grade and also some other details. So here is the results of the percentage of accuracy of the transbiopsis versus the transperineal mapping biopsies. So following that, uh, uh, Dr. Crawford developed in the clinical setting this uh, system in which the ultrasound probe is uh, still uh, positioned uh, in the uh, rectum of the patient, but the biopsies are not through the rectum, but are through the peritoneum. And then we have here a template that we'll see in other details with the gun that we are going to approach basically the prostate in a 360 degrees without the interference of the size of the, uh, of the, of the gland. And this is a cartoon just to express the, the position of the prostate that we see in the ultrasound, that here is the probe to provide the images of the prostate, and then the template that it has this uh, alignment like in a ship uh, war, um, letters and, and numbers, that allows us to identify the exact position of each core that we are going to use in the biopsies. And then the number of cores is going to depend on the size of the prostate. So if it is a small prostate, we're going to have a lower number of biopsies as compared with a prostate of larger size. And these uh, prostate biopsies are taken at a distance of uh, five millimeters uh, between each biopsy uh, site. This will be the, the, the lateral view of the template, similar to what we saw here. Uh, it is represented in this case. Uh, then this is just uh, the way that in real life looks the template in the perineum of the patient. This is the scrotum, the anus with the probe, and then the template uh, applied against the Trans, uh, the, the perineal uh, area. Uh, the splates are the ones, exactly the same ones that are used for, for bracti therapy. And they are either used uh, one side with the um, numbers uh, every five millimeters. And then uh, on the other side, if you want to do sampling every 10 millimeters. Uh, the biopsies are placed in these cassettes and try, trying to save uh, material, we put three biopsies in each, the only one biopsy is taken in each place. So we can put three biopsies identified with these uh, ink colors. And then in the uh, port in the slide, we're going to have the same uh, three biopsies and we can identify them by the ink color. In this case, it's black, green, and blue. So uh, we, uh, based on this, we are uh, able to do some uh, reconstructions of the prostate. First of all, the reconstructions of the uh, prostate itself based on the uh, ultrasound of, of, of the prostate. Uh, here we can see the, the first alignment of the, the prostate that is in the center. And then we are going to have the volume measurement uh, just to have an accurate representation later on when we do the three dimensional reconstruction then we are going to fix the template in relationship with the prostate with the fiduciary uh, probes that are going to keep the plate in place. So as the patient moves, it moves together with the, with the plate. And then we, uh, here is uh, Dr. Crawford uh, taking the samples of the prostate and even uh, checking on the ultrasound and all these locations are going to be identified and each core is going to go to a completely different vial and identify with the number with, and the letter of the specific uh, location of in, in the grid. Here is the representation of the grid on the, uh, on the table and then the biopsies are being, uh, uh, the, the tip of the biopsy, the most internal aspect is, is uh, with uh, black ink to 
know the orientation. And once these biopsies are ready, uh, here we have an assortment of uh, vials. Uh, each one is one core that is going to go to the pathology laboratory. And then we are going to produce a uh, report based on the specific identification of each core. This is the, pros the, the, the software in which you can see the uh, slices obtained by the ultrasound and the reconstruction of the prostate uh, exactly as the prostate is in vivo in the patient. And now the software can introduce the data of the different coordinates with the different results. And in this particular case, uh, with the cancer uh, present in this patient, represented by those uh, uh, images in, in orange, and um, we can assess and in a very specific way the location of the, the cancer. Here is just uh, an example of one of these protocols or reports for the mapping biopsy that we had to develop due to the number of cores in which you can see that the specimen is identified with a number and a letter, and also if it is anterior or posterior, the length of the core and in which slide, in each slide we're going to have three specimens, black, green, and blue, with the results, uh, with corresponding pathology reports or results uh, in case of prostatic tissue or fibromuscular tissue, the ones with cancer. And this is the data that was going to be transferred to produce is a nice three-dimensional uh, representations. And this is a, a screen captures of these prostates in which we can uh, remove all the negative uh, cores, all these ones that are just in, in purple are the ones negative and we, want to, we can uh, keep the data that it has the uh, cores with the positive um, cancer. Uh, this is another view, we can see the, the location and this is uh, an, another uh, case in which there is a different kind of location for this tumor, uh, is multifocal, is more dispersed. In the previous one, it was more focal, focalized. Probably this patient is susceptible to have a more specific and conservative therapy with freezing this area of the prostate, whereas individuals that have a more disseminated, they will require the freezing of the whole prostate or just a radical uh, prostatectomy, as you can see here. These are uh, cases with very uh, distinct, uh, different locations of the with, and each color is going to be also representing different uh, scores of the glisson grading. Uh, again, this is a view from the uh, anterior aspect, etc. So this will allow us to produce, uh, as I mentioned before, a more specific therapy, like in the case of thiotherapy, in which we have to align, or uh, since these gold markers were uh, applied at the time of the uh, first biopsy that they were left in the patient. And then we go back with the same plate that we align the plate as you can see here to have exactly the same position that it had before when the, the, the samples were taken and then probes with temperature. So this area of the posterior lateral uh, aspects of the prostate is where we have the erectile nerves. So trying to avoid problems of uh, erectile dysfunction then this area is protected with this uh, probes uh, a warm temperature. So the other probes that are going to be introduced with the liquid nitrogen are going to basically uh, freeze these uh, areas of where the cancer is. Now, in cases that we have uh, more uh, tumors, uh, we can do a, a, what is called a total cryotherapy in which the prostate is uh, basically approached with a series of, uh, of these special needles that are going to uh, deliver the liquid nitrogen in both lobes. And then once these are in position, the liquid nitrogen is going to be released, freezing the parenchyma of the prostate and also in this particular case, it's not shown here, these nerves are being protected by other probes with warm temperature so they don't freeze uh, uh, as well. 
So the alternative therapy is a classical radical uh, prostatectomy. And for that, in this particular case, we have a, a specimen that because the nature of the tissue in the prostate is so hard and fibrotic and muscle, it's very difficult to uh, fix. So we need to use uh, some alternative techniques uh, that are not used in other specimens like injection of uh, formalin and also microwave um, uh, techniques to be able to favor the diffusion of formalin inside the, the parenchyma of the prostate. Otherwise, only the external aspect is fixed and the internal aspect becomes um, uh, rotten. This is just a section. It's very easy to see this nodular hyperplasia, but sometimes it's very difficult to identify cancer because uh, interestingly enough, the cancer can produce a lot of volume, but it doesn't alter the symmetry of the uh, specimen unless it's a very large cancer. <clears throat> so small cancers are uh, difficult to detect in, uh, in, forma, in, in, in a very direct way. And we have developed this uh, for the residents especially, since these specimens are not in, provided to the specimen for the residents to process, we have a special uh, processing in our prostate laboratory. Here, uh, our technician, Nancy Duma, was uh, showing how to ink the prostate. The right uh, side uh, is green and the left side is in blue. And then uh, to make the story short, uh, at the, uh, after they are covered, we recover them with black ink because the blue and the green is not very homogeneous, whereas the black is more stable in, in regards to uh, identifying the margins. And now here, uh, she's removing the uh, seminal vesicles, and then doing the proper measurements, and then the volume is done with this uh, water displacement in this cylindrical uh, probe that we have water and based on the how much water is being displaced, we can get a very nice measurement of the volume. And now we are going to start sectioning the prostate from apex to base with four millimeters uh, thickness in each one. And the last part of the sectioning is done with scissors to avoid tearing out the surgical margin. And then after all these sections are done, then they are positioned, now here the cutting these the seminal vesicles. Then we have this uh, nice array of sections for the whole prostate from apex to base and the seminal vesicles that they are uh, submitted for uh, paraffin processing uh, in special cassettes as they are the small pieces of tissue or for the larger pieces of tissue, we use this uh, material that is called crinoline. And this is the same material that is used by in old fashioned uh, hats for women or for uh, brides. Uh, they can use uh, this kind of a veil in front uh, their face. And then after we have these uh, paraffin blocks, we do the corresponding sections going into the uh, water bath where they can get stretched and we can fish them and put them in slice and get these nice preparations from the apex all the way to the base. And the, uh, you can see that the first and the last specimens, since the surgical margins are not around this, the, the prostate, but they are in the anterior or the posterior aspect uh, or the inferior or, and, and superior aspect of the, the prostate, then we cut them uh, transversally to be able to see the uh, the, the margins. Uh, here uh, under the microscope, uh, we outline the areas of tumor. In this particular case, the, the, the purple corresponds to gleason four, the green corresponds to gleason three. Uh, this uh, red with yellow uh, center is the uh, area of high grade pin, and the areas in red are gleason five. You can see here two different tumors, one here and the other in the other globe, completely different. This is a four plus three, and this will be a three plus four. Here we have two different patients. And the most common approach um, finding of the location of cancer, as I mentioned before, is in the posterior aspect. And that's why we are able to uh, approach them through the 
uh, transrectal uh, approach. However, a good number uh, of uh, these cancers is just in the anterior aspect, even though there are just few glands in the anterior part of the prostate, we can have significant amount of cancer that cannot be detected with transrectal uh, approach, the classical transrectal approach. And then once we have all these uh, slides completely uh, identified and mapped where we have the outline of the prostate cancer, we can go and do some three-dimensional reconstruction using the software designed by Dr. Larry Miller and Priyo Yolwerahera. And we have these beautiful images of these prostates with the blue uh, representing the urethra. And this, in this particular case, two different cancers, one gleason three, another a higher grade. We have been able to present uh, several papers using this uh, three-dimensional approach in which we can really uh, play with uh, these uh, images in the computer and get these uh, nice sections uh, that uh, are very difficult to uh, reproduce in, using other methods or just transrectal trans, uh, uh, biopsies. So using this five millimeter grid, uh, it was important that the, we found that the five millimeter is more accurate than the 10 millimeter distance between the between the um, cores, uh, we can have a very important staging tool that basically reflects in vivo the real amount of prostate cancer the patient has. We are not going to be uh, concerned about the presence of a cancer that is in an area that it cannot be reached by the needles. No, this transperineal approach is going to give us an approach of 360 degrees of the prostate and then with a more sensibility of diagnosis. In many cases, this estimation that 30% of cases that are negative or they have just a mild or low grade cancer uh, can be uh, missed uh, the, the higher grade cancer or, or the uh, other uh, in, in other locations. So the transperineal mapping biopsy can detect or rule out more aggressive disease, especially if we want to go with these patients to do what, what is called watchful waiting. So if we just have transrectal biopsies and we find a glisson three plus three, and we tell the patient, oh yeah, well, we're going to just check you out, uh, we do watchful waiting. Uh, that is going to be kind of a risky business because we don't know for sure if there is a higher grade cancer in the anterior aspect of the prostate, especially if the patient has a large prostate. So the results are uh, very evident and that's also documented in our paper uh, in 2019, in which we compare the trans biopsies with the transperineal biopsies, including uh, a very significant finding of prostate cancer, even the glissons more than seven in score, and then uh, in many patients that had negative transbiosis, we, but there is still an elevated PSA, for example, then the, the transperineal are able to identify cancer in an easier way. Also the uh, infections, to go through the rectum, as you can imagine, is just uh, calling for a contamination from the rectal flora, but going through the perineal, is just uh, under surgical conditions in uh, the, the skin is completely uh, sterilized and the complications are very uh, low as we can see here, uh, also uh, during the infection infections. So the prostate cancer uh, using this uh, transperitinal battery biopsy was uh, uh, diagnosed twice the number of patients using the transperineal uh, approach as compared with the trans biopsies in uh, two out of three uh, men who were negative for trans biopsies. And then they're really associated with infection and they are uh, with some a little bit of increased incidence uh, as we saw before of uh, urinary retention or urinary um, uh, sometimes infection, but uh, because of the multiple um, sampling that may produce some edema in the prostate and, and 
the, the is transitory. Uh, this was a uh, another uh, publication 2013, the uh, where we correlated the transperineals with prostates, uh, three-dimensional reconstructions of, of prostatectomy specimens, and we found that the uh, basically the the there, there was basically no difference between the results obtained in the three-dimensional reconstruction of prostates in vivo with the help of transperineal mapping biopsies as compared with the same patients that they had to receive a radical prostatectomy. And then we did the reconstruction of the prostate and we compared the results of the in vivo finding with the post-surgical findings in the prostatectomy. There was almost no difference. So that's what we call uh, that this approach is even, uh, it has the capacity to do a real staging of the prostate cancer without having to have the prostate in your hands. These are a few cases that I just wanted to show, uh, share with you. It's a patient who was uh, with a mild increase of PSA. And then in the left side, it has a piece on three plus three with a 5% in two of 10 cores. And then the right was completely negative in 12 cores. These are the pictures of the tumor with a uh, h &E staining, and then with the high molecular uh, cytokeratin staining, you can see the normal or benign glands with uh, lining, lined by basal cells, positive for high molecular waste cytokeratin. And then the cancer is those uh, small uh, glands here and here that are negative for uh, high molecular waste cytokeratin. This patient was brief. Uh, of well, the different possibilities of therapy, uh, including radical prostatectomy, radiation, seeds, watchful waiting. And then the urologist uh, suggested watchful waiting because it was just a low grade cancer and very minimal. The patient went berserk. He dijo, No, I have cancer. Get the prostate out of here. So he went to surgery. And then this was the size of the prostate, very important point. 50 cc, more than twice this normal size of a person in a young person. And this is the same section that I mentioned before, where you can see that this patient, this was the glisson three plus three was detected in the transrectal biopsy. And this is the four plus five that was found in the prostatectomy specimen. So you can imagine that the needles in this 50 cc biopsy uh, it was almost going to be impossible to be detected, but just for the transrectal uh, approach. This is just a high power uh, histological uh, sample of the glisson 5 that he had in, in this area uh, of the prostate. So uh, the final pathology report had a glisson 4 plus 5 that you can compare with the previous. Uh, uh, Trans biopsy, trans biopsies biopsies that show was on was only showing the three plus three cancer. This is another case PSA high that went from thirteen to twenty three in four years, and then also the PCA three that is an antigen that is really with um, uh, tumor. The uh, however the biopsies were negative. The trans uh, rectal ultrasound guided biopsies were all negative. And also the CT scan, the opportunity, the magnetic, uh, magnetic resonance, it showed no definitive evidence of uh, prostate cancer. So the transperineal mapping biopsies were uh, performed and the patient had a significant amount of cancer in the anterior aspect of the prostate with multifocality 3.3, 3.4, 3, 4, 4.5, 4.3, et cetera. So, you can imagine the, 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 the benefit for this patient uh, to, find, to be able to find cancer and not to expose them because he had negative transbiosis, negative MRI. Okay, well, probably you have an infection. We are going to treat you, uh, et cetera, watchful waiting when the patient had already even a glisson four plus five. Anyway, so transperineal myopsis and the use of this three-dimensional reconstruction of in vivo prostate closely reflects, reflects the true prostate cancer disease. 
as we can compare when we get the prostate in our hands after the prostatectomy. So the in vivo reconstruction is very almost the same as these uh, prostatectomy reconstructions. If we can detect or rule out more aggressive cancer, identify more accurately the glisson grade and the tumor size, the location, of course, ensuring that the patients are not mistakenly undertreated or unnecessarily overtreated, minimizing the therapy related morbidity. So these are some of the uh, references that we uh, mentioned in, during the presentation. And these are the people, they probably are missing some. If you don't see your name, uh, I apologize, but Priya Barajera was the uh, engineer basically that conceived with Dr. Miller that I put him here at the base because he's the one who started all this business of the 3D uh, examination of the prostate, as you saw in his grants, uh, early grants. And then we have followed from the clinical aspect with Dr. Crawford, Dr. Lucia in our pathology group, Dr. Barkawi also in the uh, clinical aspect, as well as Dr. Maroni, Dr. Spitzer and James Heath were uh, collaborators for the development of the normal prostate uh, three-dimensional reconstruction. And our colleagues, uh, Paul, Erin, Phil, Bob, Story, uh, they are all have spent uh, hundreds and thousands of hours in developing all these material during probably more than 20 years since we lost uh, the presence of Dr. Miller. And I would like to take the opportunity to make an homage to him. And he was my professor uh, during the time that I was doing residency here in, in, in this department of pathology. And the, as a uh, very nice tribute uh, written in this, uh, Cancer Biology and Therapy, here you have the, um, the link in which, and I want to read it because this is the most, uh, the first way to uh, correlate the way that Gary made many highly significant contributions to prostate cancer research, demonstrating the need to use computer assisted 3D reconstruction to understand the natural history of prostate cancer. He analyzed hundreds of radical prostatectomy specimens, and he was the first one to show that prostate cancer was multifocal in space. Every, the people before, they saw that because it was cancer, it was already spreading from one focus and going here and there. But this is one of the few cancers that has this kind of multifocality. that are completely different uh, uh, genomes. The, he was able to do uh, special molecular studies of the different cancers or, uh, in, in the same patient. And he found that they were not related. They were completely independent cancer uh, foci. And see, he also showed that many tumors represent collisions between multifocal lesions. And he used these three-dimensional models to demonstrate the lack of effectiveness of standard sextant biopsies. So because and before they were just doing just a few biopsies and then if they were negative, okay, you don't have cancer. But he was the one who correlated these first uh, uh, studies uh, to find cancer that was uh, not being sampled by the conventional uh, practices. And so he developed this his own computerized system. They, they uh, with Priya Virajera, they developed this software that we still use in our race, that in a very old computer, because we cannot put it in the new, new Windows system. And we are able to see these uh, beautiful three-dimensional reconstructions. So I'm here in the RC1. <laughs> See, someone wants to find me. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. LaRosa. That, that was an incredible um, visual uh, grand rounds. <laughs> Some of the best I think uh, one can possibly see. So hi, Paco, this is Carrie. Hey. Um, hi. My question has to do with um, just the the logistics and cost effectiveness of these uh, mapping biopsies to really localize where the cancers are. Because in my mind, the two surgical options are either prostatectomy or TERP and not really anything in between that you could kind of target where these small foci of cancer might be. 
So I didn't know if you knew of any other surgical options that existed. And then the second part of the question just has to do with, are there limits on how many times a pathologist can code um, like an 88305 for prostate? I just imagine that some insurers will balk when there's like 60 biopsies on a single patient and try to you know, um, argue against the clinical utility of that. So just wondering what your thoughts might be on those. Yeah, those are very, uh, two very good questions. Uh, the first one is that uh, the two options that you mentioned, they are not really two, they have three options because we need to uh, think in consideration that some cancers are not going to be dangerous, like three plus three. If it is very well diagnosed, there is even articles that it says three plus three doesn't kill a patient. <clears throat> so if it is a 60 year old person who has also a very good health and probably a life expectancy of 20 more years, you don't want to produce a very traumatic uh, event like doing a prostatectomy with the consequences of impotence and uh, urinary incontinence. So in those individuals, uh, there is no surgery, there is no cryotherapy, there is just watchful waiting. And I think that a great number of people are being benefited uh, this time because we prolong the application of these kind of uh, radical procedures that in the past handicap a, a lot of people without any reason, without any reason. So the patient can have a cancer, uh, but if it is a low cancer then, and it's very well circumscribed, uh, then that's an option as well. So uh, I think that the transperineal mapping biopsies can solve that question as well, because if the patient, for example, has a PSA that is high, and, and, and the transrectal trans resection uh, biopsies are, are negative, we're still thinking that probably has cancer. So we do the transperineal, and then we may find so a few foci of 3 3 and then that's it. No, no need to be so aggressive in those cases. Or the patient uh, had a elevated PSA, and he has glissons 3 plus 3, so you have a dilemma. Do I put this patient in a watchful waiting because he's C3 or uh, we do a pro radical prostatectomy? But the radical prostatectomy or, or even the same uh, cryotherapy has uh, sequela. So you want to be sure that it has no uh, four plus five in the anterior aspect and all that. So in that case, the transperineal is going to solve that problem. So you, I think that the spectrum, the way that you're gonna approach the patient it is, it is safer to use in the transperineal. And, and, and you consider the, as I, will, uh, as I said again, the consequences of a radi radical procedure, uh, I will go, even if it is a little bit more traumatic and it's going to cost more, but it's give you many, many years of living a more normal life as compared with individuals that just because they have a three plus C or small focus, they get a, the prostate chopped. Anyway, so that would be one uh, consideration. And, and I think that uh, the other one is regards to price. Definitely, I think that if you ask uh, Scott Lucia, uh, they do to do at uh, this time transperineal biopsies, especially if they are a larger number, over 50 biopsies, uh, it's not a good business. Uh, so we need to compensate with the profits that came from other uh, size. Uh, so, uh, but, but it's still, uh, since we are in an integrated practice, uh, <clears throat> the hospital can uh, put together a whole package and we cannot see just the, the cost effect of only one procedure, but the whole integrated package, especially if it is going to be in favor of the patient. If anybody does think of something later, they can certainly contact Dr. La Rosa by uh, email. He's very interactive with teaching for sure. So um, thank you all for attending. And um, thank you, Dr. La Rosa, for an incredible visual treat <laughs> for Grand Rounds this, this time around. Very fine. Thank you all.